its trout streams in England, three widely differing forms of riverside life meet in an annual contest. The first is the fly fisherman. He comes to cast his artificial dry fly on the gin clear water. Well, if it lands as heavily as that, it won't fool many trout. The second component of this trout who fatally took the angler's imitation mayfly was a pound in weight. He began his life in this river less than two years ago. In the summer, he took flies at the surface as a kind of gourmet appetizer. All the year round, he finds most of his food down among the weed beds. A trout's life begins in the autumn. The colder weather heralds spawning time. Most freshwater fish in Britain spawn in the spring, but all members of the salmon family, which includes the trout, choose November through to January in which to breed. They spawn on gravelly shallows. The size of the actual pebbles is one of the factors that decides their selection of spawning bed. It's called a red. By rapid movements of her tail, the female cuts a hole in the gravel. Just downstream, the males queue up for the female's favours. These preliminaries last several days, and there's a lot of jockeying for position, and even fighting amongst the males. Most of the scrapping consists of tail biting. The male's characteristically hooked lower jaw adds to their aggressively masculine appearance. All this time, the females continue cutting out the hole in which they'll lay their eggs. They don't actually shift the gravel with their tails. It's the current they whip up which does the work. At last, a successful male joins her on the red. The female still continues to cut out the nest. From time to time, she checks her position over it by feeling with her lower fins. The male often courts the female by rubbing against her. He recognizes when she's ready to shed her eggs by the fact that she keeps her anal fin down in the red. Arch-backed and open-mouthed, they spawn. In running water, Milton eggs have just two seconds to make contact. The cup-shaped nest helps to keep sperm and eggs in contact for the vital few seconds. But she starts to cover the eggs with gravel immediately. No matter how conscientious she is, a few always get whipped away by the current. Like fielders in the slips, other trout downstream neatly collect them. Some remain on top of the gravel that covers the newly closed red. They'll soon be scavenged too. They may even fall victim to a small bird who specializes in underwater feeding, the dipper. Dippers live mainly on stony mountain streams, but you occasionally find them on South Country chalk rivers too. They can not only walk underwater, but they fly beneath the surface too. They cling on and move large stones in search of food, like trout eggs. Thank <laughs> you. 
When a depot goes to work on a trout red, not many unburied eggs go to waste. The eggs are the beginning of the trout story. But what about the mayflies? This wriggling larva, or nymph, spends up to three years on the riverbed before hatching as a fly. It can swim freely when disturbed. All that time, it's in danger of being eaten by many creatures, including the trout. The mayfly nymph buries itself for protection in whatever shelter it can find on the riverbed. The waving filaments are the gills with which it breathes. Sometimes it hides in gravel, but more often in silt. During its three-year river life, it'll shed its skin many times and emerge bigger each time. Each stage is called an instar. The mayfly is by no means alone in its search for shelter and disguise. Silopalipes is a caddis or sedge fly. Sedge fly larvae build themselves little houses of stones or sometimes of dead vegetation. In this way, they hope to avoid the hungry eyes of the trout and other predators. The larvae search methodically for exactly the right stone for the next stage of house building. This larva has built itself a house of dark stones, but for some reason it rejects what seems to be a perfect color match. Having found exactly the piece it wants, it offers it up for size, rather like a mason building a stone wall. The caddis is pleased with the effect and cements it into place with saliva. One summer's evening, the occupant will leave this neat stone house and rise to the surface to hatch into another fly, dear to trout and to trout fishermen who call it simply a sedge. Until then, it intends to be safe from attack. This occupant of the trout stream doesn't have to build his protection, he grows it. But at this moment, the crayfish, the little freshwater lobster, is vulnerable. The only way he can grow is by shedding his hard outer casing. He's nearly done that, and his new shell hasn't fully hardened. In getting rid of his old one, he's also shed the otoliths, or ear stones, that are his only means of balancing. So for the moment, he doesn't know up from down. The minnows hanging around in the hope of scraps are too small to hurt him. Other fish, especially the chub, which live in the trout stream, are very partial to lobster. So he'd better get himself sorted out quickly. Luckily, that trout didn't notice him. All he's got to do now is to get his balance worked out again. For the moment, he seems to have made it. The trout eggs have lain buried in the gravel for three cold winter months. Now, around the hundredth day, the life inside them is fighting to get out. The fry that emerge seem to be all eyes. But they have another, even more prominent feature, a bulging yolk sac of nourishment beneath the stomach. These alevins don't at this stage have to expose themselves to danger by hunting around for food. The yolk sac contains all they need for the first three weeks of their lives. By the end of the three weeks, they're taking on a darker color and the yolk sac is swiftly being absorbed. They look more like little fish now. They've passed the alevin stage and have become fingerlings.
After a month or more, they're colouring up fast, beginning to acquire the characteristic dark finger marks along the flank, which mark the par stage. Spots come later. At three months, they're proper little miniature trout at last. But this doesn't mean they're safe. They're still only two or three inches long. Trout par make a tempting snack for even the smallest pike. There's some evidence that pike show a marked preference for trout. The pike wasn't quick enough for that one. Of the seven or eight thousand eggs laid by a female trout, very few survive to breeding age. The wastage is colossal and pike aren't the only cause. That's a chub moving up now. They're mighty predatory too. Chub have no sharp holding teeth like pike. Instead, they've got grinding teeth in their throats. All they've got to do with the small fish is to suck in hard. Even tiny minnows sometimes receive the pike's unwelcome attentions. But here's an extraordinary situation, never before recorded on film. This pike apparently allows the minnows to clean the old mucus from his scales. Symbiosis, one fish associating with another to their mutual benefit. It's common enough among marine species, but it's not been observed before in freshwater. Even a two pound pike like this can cause havoc in a trout stream. No wonder river keepers regard them as a menace. Like everything else in the countryside, life in the trout stream speeds up when spring comes. This is partly due to the warming up of the water, but also to the amount and brightness of the sunlight penetrating the clear surface. Trout are a race apart when it comes to spawning. They breed in the winter, though all other British freshwater fish spawn in early spring. One of the smallest fish in the stream has the most exciting breeding rituals of all. He's a proper little caveman. The bullhead, Cotus gobio, is sometimes called the miller's thumb. Millers were supposed to get a flattened thumb because they were constantly feeling the quality of grain and flour. This is the male. He's busy clearing pebbles from the cave into which he hopes to lure a female. He's no more than two inches long but he can move stones almost as heavy as himself. Once he's cleared out the hollow, which will become the nest, he takes up position in the entrance and makes a barking noise. This is to attract females and deter rival males, like this intruder. The resident male has made himself very dark. That's all part of the intimidation process. Now that issue has been settled, the winner can begin barking again to attract a mate. The female who eventually shows up is lighter colored and more slender in build, although she's full of ripe eggs. Finally, she can't resist his serenade and comes closer. This is when the caveman stuff starts. The rival male returns and grabs her by the tail. But in bullhead society, true love is expressed by seizing the loved one by the equivalent of her hair. The occupant of the cave finally wins her. He traps
traps her inside the cave where she'll lay her eggs and he'll fertilize them. But there's one tricky maneuver to be performed first. She has to be persuaded to turn upside down to lay her egg cluster on the cave roof. The underside of this rock is very convenient. Often bullheads just lay their eggs under large stones. Once the eggs are laid and fertilized, he has no further use for her. Caveman to the last, he throws her out. But this means he has to take over the duties of the nursery himself. The main one is to make sure the eggs have sufficient flow of well aerated water inside the cave. For several weeks until they hatch, he remains on guard, fanning them with his pectoral fins. Alas, things didn't work out for the bullhead and his future family. He remains devotedly fanning, but the movement attracts the attention of a pike, small enough to get its snout into the cave. The pike now has its own problems. How to swallow a fish with a row of sharp spines on its raised dorsal fin. But he'll manage in the end. The eggs, now unattended, will probably never hatch out. The countryside is in full bloom. On the banks of the trout stream, it's a peacock time of the year. It's late May and the trees in the water meadows are wearing a color so intense it burns like a green flame. It's the crown of the year. It's also the time of the Mayfly Carnival when the trout have a banquet in store for them. These trout are looking for mayfly nymphs, moving out of the weeds and silt to rise to the surface to hatch. The hatching process is a tricky one. The nymph has to swim to the surface and split its skin before the immature adult mayfly can emerge. In a second or two, an aquatic creature with gills turns into an air-breathing insect. At this stage, the scientist calls it a sub-imago, or sub-adult. To the angler, it's a dun. Dun because its wings are as yet dull and dun-colored. It has no mouth and no stomach. Its only purpose in life is to breed. Before it can do that, it has one more important stage in its life history to pass through though that won't happen for perhaps 24 hours. All it has to do for the moment is to escape from the surface of the river. Its empty nymphal shuck floats downstream close by. The mayfly hatch lasts barely a fortnight. It's always the same fortnight in late May or early June on each individual river. The mayfly ephemera danica, the biggest and juiciest of all aquatic flies enjoys a brief two weeks of summer glory. By no means all hatch successfully. Some get their wings caught on the surface film and never manage to become airborne. As the days pass, the hatch increases. Duns and empty shucks litter the surface of the river. The amount of mayfly emerging varies throughout the day. When there's a big hatch on, it isn't only the trout who have agility. Fortunately, in this case, nature vastly overproduces, so there are plenty of mayfly left to carry on the species. Many anglers swear the hatches have decreased in recent years. And
Despite all these attacks, plenty of duns escaped from the river to shelter on bankside vegetation. And there, a day later, they performed their last and most glittering transformation of all. From the skin of the dun emerges a perfect shimmering mayfly, the true adult, the imago, the one-day wonder that exists only to reproduce its kind. usually calls the imagos spinners. Once the females return to the water to lay their eggs and die, they're known as spent spinners or spent gnats. It's all very confusing and all part of the mystique and folklore of dry fly fishing. The female spinner makes it, drawing out her three long CT or tails with which she balances in flight. She's a fairy queen of a fly with beautiful translucent wings. She's ready now to find a mate among the dancing clouds of male spinners. She'll fly into the wavering swarm, be seized and fertilized in midair, or perhaps carried away to the grass for mating to take place. Now comes the last and most ingenious act of the mayfly carnival. Mayflies hadn't made this instinctive alliance. The species would long ago have ended up in the sea and no doubt become extinct. The rings are made by a dying female. The females always fly upstream to lay their eggs. Cancelling out trio is the trout. Trout often go feeding mad during the mayfly hatch. Every now and again, one mistakes the angler's imitation for the genuine article. The lifelines of mayfly and trout cross. This is the end of the trout story. But how did it begin for both the mayfly and the trout? <laughs> <laughs> 